Thank you for inviting me to come speak today. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I am fairly new to children's, having just joined the faculty about two years ago uh, in the Department of Gastroenterology, which is a really growing and expanding division. So uh, it's my pleasure. Um, I'd like to discuss an entity that is dear to my heart and that we, um, uh, a disease that we see a tremendous amount of gastroesophageal reflux disease. I'd first like to start by going over some definitions. Um, we toss around terms like reflux, regurgitation, GERD. Uh, gastroesophageal reflux refers to passage of gastric contents in, into the esophagus. It's referred to as gastroesophageal reflux disease when it leads to complications and symptoms that are disruptive to a person or a child's life. Um, and uh, we often will see GERD in infants as well, um, and that makes it complicated GERD, uh, and we're going to go over some examples of complicated GERD also. Regurgitation is passage of reflux contents into the oropharynx, or, or spitting up, and then vomiting is expulsion of the reflux contents out of the mouth. Regurgitation, or spitting up, as we all know, is very, very common in infancy. It it occurs up, uh, at least once a day in up to half of infants age zero to three months, and it tends to peak at about age four to six months of age. So when parents come in to see me at age two to three months and say, when will this end? Um, it, you know, it, it, the answer is that it often tends to peak between the ages of four to six months before it starts to get better. The vast majority of infants will stop spitting up by the age of 12 months. And so that's the kind of time frame that I often will give parents as to what to expect as far as uncomplicated spitting up. Um, they, this is a, a graph looking at the prevalence of reflux symptoms in children. The green bar is younger children, and this is parents reporting for their younger children ages three to nine years. Um, and you can see that more often they, they are complaining about epigastric pain as a symptom for reflux whereas older children ages 10 to 17 will more often complain of heartburn and regurgitation. And this in stark contrast to the adult numbers where 20% of adults are complaining about heartburn and regurgitation symptoms. So though it is common in children, it is much less frequent for children to have symptoms than it is for adults to have these types of symptoms. Nonetheless, pediatric reflux presents in very many different ways. It's not just heartburn and regurgitation. These are some presenting signs and symptoms of reflux that, I, that um, we often see. Recurrent vomiting in an infant. Recurrent vomiting and poor weight gain in an infant. Recurrent vomiting and irritability. Recurrent vomiting in an older child. Heartburn. Esophagitis. Dysphagia or feeding refusal. And this is um, you know, something that we pay attention to frequently when we see children who are um, toddlers who are refusing to eat um, to take a really good history about uh, reflux symptoms or a history of infantile reflux that hasn't fully resolved. Apnea or um, all, uh, apparent life-threatening event, asthma, recurrent pneumonia, and upper airway symptoms. So although the incidence of heartburn and regurgitation is much less frequent, we see it presenting in very different ways in younger children. There are also several at-risk populations for reflux. Um, children with neurologic impairment, children with obesity, so um, uh, we see many children who are obese and have reflux symptoms. Children who have repaired esophageal atresia or tracheoesophageal fistula. Children with chronic lung disease or asthma, uh, repaired achalasia. And of note, um, children with hiatal hernia. So hiatal hernia can predispose someone to having more uh, reflux symptoms. So the diagnostic approach depends on the signs and symptoms that we're seeing. Certainly a full history and physical examination. Upper GI series is not a test to diagnose reflux. Uh, it's, a, um, it's a test to diagnose a, uh, an anatomic abnormality. So it can pick up a hiatal hernia, it can diagnose a malrotation, it can diagnose achalasia, it, um, it can diagnose a stricture, but it, it's not a good test for reflux, and I'm gonna go into that a little bit more. 
esophageal pH probe monitoring, upper endoscopy with biopsies. Again, not a good test to diagnose reflux, but a good test to rule out other causes of reflux symptoms. So there are other things like eosinophilic esophagitis or H. pylori that can mimic reflux and that can cause the symptoms to persist despite maximal medical management. And the old empirical medical therapy, which uh, we frequently will, will um, use to see if we can improve the symptoms with an acid blocker, and I'm going to go into that in more detail as well. So in upper GI series, the advantage is to evaluate the anatomy. And uh, often in, in a child who's having recurrent vomiting, it's very important to rule out an anatomic abnormality. The limitations are, and this is important, it can't distinguish between physiologic and non-physiologic reflux. We're all refluxing here, especially after a meal. Everyone is having episodes of reflux during the day. But uh, for, for many of us, it's physiologic reflux. It's not leading to any symptoms. And so an upper GI series might show us an episode of reflux, but it could be an episode of physiologic reflux and not one that's necessarily leading to the symptoms. Um, so this is, the test is best done and ordered to rule out an anatomic abnormality like malrotation. And certainly if there is any history of bilious emesis, uh, you know, it, it, it is a um, very important test to run. Uh, equally with dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, it's an important test to do. Esophageal pH probe monitoring. Um, it is a, uh, a good test to detect episodes of acid reflux. We can correlate symptoms with the acid uh, reflux episodes with this test, uh, which is a bonus. And we can also assess the efficacy of our treatment with this test. The downsides are that you can't diagnose alkaline reflux. And infants, especially who are being fed very frequently with formula, which makes the stomach contents alkaline, it, it can impede the ability to diagnose reflux, uh, acidic reflux. Um, and it's not useful in detecting ap episodes of apnea in um, conjunction with reflux episodes. So, you might be lucky and catch a very obvious episode of apnea during your pH probe, but the better test is to do this in conjunction with a sleep study where you can actually measure the, the um, chest movement, chest wall movements, and measure the um, CO2 output. Um, this is uh, the upper endoscopy. Again, the advantage to upper endoscopy is to visualize the mucosa, rule out any ulcers, rule out severe gastritis. Most important, though, is to rule out other causes. So if you've treated someone, um, yet they're still not responding, endoscopy can be important to rule out H. pylori or eosinophilic esophagitis or a large ulcer that may not be um, fully treated. Um, disadvantages are obviously need, the need for anesthesia, um, and it's not helpful in correlating symptoms in any way. Nuclear scintigraphy or a milk scan um, is a way of uh, radio labeling formula or milk, feeding it to the child, and then scanning the um, scanning the child to follow it, the gastric emptying of the milk from the stomach. You can then also do a scan 12 or 24 hours later to see if there are any um, if there is any tracer within the lungs that might indicate aspiration over time. Um, and it, and it may indeed have a role to play in diagnosing aspiration and gastric emptying. It's not a very sensitive test to diagnose aspiration. So the, um, the sensitivity is only anywhere from 15 to 50 percent. So um, a negative um, test for aspiration does not rule out aspiration with a milk scan. There are very poorly established standards for reflux and for gastric emptying in children. So it is not a good test to diagnose reflux with. It can aid you in looking at gastric emptying, um, but it, it's not a good test to make a diagnosis of reflux with. And NAS began our national, um, North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, and their guidelines has stated that it's not recommended for routine evaluation in, in children with suspected reflux. This is a more new test that's coming down the line, and um, we have recently acquired the equipment at Children's, and we're working on getting up the ability to do impedance probe monitoring. The advantages of the impedance probe is that you can measure 
It, it's a way of measuring the impedance of a bolus, either of air, food, or liquid. And so you can measure, it doesn't rely on the need for measuring acidity. So you can measure alkalinity or you know, any kind of bolus that's coming back up. Um, and for this, because of the difficulties in measuring acid reflux in infants because of their frequent feeding, this may be a better test for looking at reflux and respiratory symptoms in infants. Um, and there, you know, there are children who have alkaline or bile reflux, um, and for, the, for those children, the impedance probe will be a better test for them. There are still a lot of studies looking at trying to, again, establish norms and establish guidelines on how to interpret these tests, so it's still um, evolving. So uh, in summary, as far as a diagnostic workup for reflux, the, diagnos the diagnosis is often made clinically. We can often make this diagnosis clinically without doing any testing, and usually that, that is the case. Um, tests are useful when the diagnosis of reflux is unclear to document the presence of pathologic reflux versus physiologic reflux, to establish a causal relationship between some of the symptoms that we're seeing um, and uh, acid reflux, to evaluate therapy to make sure that our acid blockers are working and that we have um, effective acid blockade, and to exclude other conditions. And no one test can address all of these questions. Sometimes we need a combination of an upper GI series and a pH probe or endoscopy in order to put everything together and understand, have a better understanding about what's going on. Again, these are, um, this, is, this is a repeat of the list that I showed before about different presenting signs and symptoms of reflux. Um, history in a child with suspected GERD. Um, definitely want to take a history about feeding. Um, uh, many children are overfeeding and are being overfed. Um, uh, give, we give guidelines about positioning in infants, so holding them upright at least 30 minutes after feeding. Um, we want to take a history about the pattern of vomiting, uh, the frequency of the vomiting, and the amount of vomiting. Is it happening at, only at nighttime or early in the morning? Um, is it forceful? Is it bilious? Um, is there an, uh, an allergy history or a metabolic history within the family? And is the child growing? Um, and a, a um, neurologic history is also very important. Um, after the history and physical part, the next part is to um, think about warning signs that might indicate that there's something more than reflux going on. Um, so bilious or forceful emesis, hematemesis or hematochesia, vomiting and diarrhea, which might indicate that there's more of an infection, abdominal tenderness and distension, Onset of vomiting after six months of age. So we typically see reflux occurring from a few weeks of age. It progresses, reaches a crescendo after a few months of age, and then will generally tend to get better. We, we get concerned when the vomiting starts a bit later. It's a little uncharacteristic. And also, if it persists beyond 12 to 18 months of age, we start to think about what else is going on. This doesn't seem like run-of-the-mill reflux. Obviously, fever, fever, lethargy, hepatosplenomegaly raise concerns. And um, CNS abnormalities, we always are trying to keep in mind whenever we're dealing with reflux and vomiting. So looking for macrocephaly or microcephaly, um, seizures, or any abnormalities on neurologic history or physical exam. So if there are no warning signs, then we try to classify reflux as simple reflux, especially in an infant. Is this something that the infant's going to outgrow? Or are there, complicated, are there complicated facets of this reflux that the child would benefit from, perhaps benefit from treatment? So poor weight gain, excessive crying or irritability, feeding problems, and respiratory problems are, um, are the four components of the infant history that I take that make me lean toward treating an infant with reflux. Um, an infant with reflux that doesn't have any of these components of complicated reflux, then I often will pro provide reassurance and try to, to um, follow the child up and, and wait and see if they will outgrow it. Um, and so this is conservative management of infants with recurrent vomiting. Um, reassurance, 
keeping in mind those warning signs. You can try thickening the formula um, or trying a hypoallergenic formula. Um, there is a 50% crossover in uh, cow's milk protein allergy and soy allergy. And so the recommendations now are to not go to soy, but to go directly to a partially hydrolyzed formula like Nutramagen or Alimentum. Um, you know, if there are genuine concerns for milk protein allergy contributing to these symptoms. And again, if the, system, if the symptoms persist beyond 12 to 18 months of age, then a referral to a pediatric gastroenterologist is certainly warranted because we're trying to figure out if there are other components to this history, um, particularly allergy in the, in the persistent reflux symptoms. Uh, if there is poor weight gain, if there are warning signs um, present, obviously we need to consider other diagnoses and, and would consider referral to GI at that point. If there are inadequate calories offered, um, one could educate, fortify the formula, and follow carefully. And if there are adequate calories offered and the child's still losing weight, then again, we're looking to expand our differential, do more testing, um, and uh, try and figure out if there's something else going on besides just run-of-the-mill reflux. So the effect of sleep position on reflux, I think this is an interesting chart. Uh, we all know about um, the, about um, supine positioning decreasing the risk of SIDS mortality and how important that um, step has um, been. Um, but if you look on the other side of the chart, it actually um, increases the reflux index in children who were t tested with a pH probe uh, while in these various positions. So it definitely can. Um, contribute to increasing reflux. It's just that the risk of SIDS mortality outweighs so much the risks of reflux that, um, that we don't recommend uh, prone positioning, except in the most severe life-threatening cases of reflux. So even though people may say the baby does so much better in prone positioning, uh, I, we should still be all recommending that babies who are less than three or four months of age be in a supine position when sleeping. In an older child, however, um, left side positioning might be helpful, and also raising the head of the bed could be helpful as well. Um, this is a picture down on the bottom of an infant in, uh, in a wedge, and so many of our patients may um, talk to you about using a wedge. We should certainly make sure that they're not using the, the wedge with a lot of other blankets and pillows. Um, it should be in, uh, in an empty crib. Um, the advantage, of the, the advantage of this wedge is that the child is propped up and isn't surrounded by a lot of other um, padding and cushioning. Um, and for an older child, definitely avoiding eating right before bed, propping the head of the bed, and left-sided positioning can be helpful with symptoms. So for the management of heartburn or chest pain, um, one can try empiric therapy, either an H2 receptor blocker or a proton pump inhibitor for a course of two to four weeks to see if there's an improvement in symptoms. And lifestyle changes is huge. Um, so weight loss if obese, avoiding fried and fast food, spicy food, caffeine, no eating before bed or exercise. This is um, a, a lot of the counseling that we're giving to um, older patients is lifestyle adjustments. Um, if there is an improvement, then we would recommend continuing a course of treatment for two to three months, and then trying to take them off of the medication to see how they do after that. Um, and if there's no change in the symptoms, then you have to be concerned that there may be something else going on, and you know look toward further evaluation. This is a um, slide concerning the management of esophagitis. So after we've diagnosed esophagitis, then. Again, we're, we're looking toward making lifestyle changes and also treatment with a H2 blocker or a proton pump inhibitor. Um, we try to optimize medical management. Um, sometimes these children need a repeat endoscopy to ensure that their esophagitis is healing. Um, sometimes they will benefit from a prokinetic, and this is, you know, this is down the line after they've been diagnosed um, with esophagitis or more severe reflux and um, consider a pH probe while on therapy to assure that your therapy is adequate. Uh, there can be respiratory symptoms associated with reflux like wheezing, chronic cough, stridor, hoarseness, recurrent pneumonia, and apnea. 
Um, in asthmatics, it's often important to treat the reflux. Um, with persistent asthma and reflux symptoms, vigorous acid suppression for three months and monitoring for symptoms can be helpful. And if there is persistent asthma and there's suspicion for reflux, though no overt symptoms of reflux, um, then you could consider an empiric course of treatment or consider a pH probe to look to document um, ongoing reflux. Um, and particularly in those children who have recurrent pneumonia, corticosteroid dependency, nocturnal asthma, the more severe asthmatics. Um, the management of reflux-associated ALTI. So, P, again, pH probe monitoring is not all that helpful for looking for reflux in relation to an apparent life-threatening event. Um, you really need a sleep study in order to really correlate um, the all, uh, um, apnea symptoms with reflux. And uh, therapeutic options include thickening the feedings and um, acid suppression. Fund application is only considered in the most severe cases of ALTI related to reflux. Reflux related pneumonia. So the, influx, the incidence of reflux related pneumonia, aspiration pneumonia in an otherwise healthy child is rather rare. Um, so certainly for children who are um, neurologically impaired, that should be much higher on the list as opposed to a neurologically normal child. Um, if there is suspicion for reflux, for reflux aspiration um, causing pneumonia. One also needs to think about aspiration from above when swallowing, um, as uh, that is often more of a, uh, an injury to the lungs than is the aspiration um, that occurs after reflux happens. And before considering reflux as a cause for recurrent pneumonia, you have to think about other causes like neuromuscular disease, esophageal or laryngeal abnormalities, or an immunodeficiency. In these cases of recurrent pneumonia, uh, where reflux is suspected, a, a combination of tests can be helpful, such as a pH probe, a bronchoscopy with um, pulmonary lavage looking for lipid-laden macrophages, again, a swallow study um, to evaluate for aspiration from above, uh, and in this case, nuclear scintigraphy can also be helpful to look for aspiration. There are several different types of medications used to treat reflux. Uh, antacids are one category. Um, we try to stay away from the use of an antacids in very young children um, due to concerns about milk alkali syndrome, uh, increased calcium um, absorption in a very young child. H2 blockers are used routinely in um, infants to older children, um, and they have been used safely uh, without significant side effects. Um, proton pump inhibitors are also used in infants uh, to older adults, although they are not FDA approved for the use in infants. There are concerns about the use of proton pump inhibitors um, in very, very young children um, and in, in children and adults in general. Um, there have been uh, uh, studies looking at increased incidence of community-acquired pneumonia and gastroenteritis in patients that are on long-term acid suppressants. Um, I think that uh, when using these medications, I always try to use them in a two to three month time course and then try to take them off of the medication and see what happens. And if we're unable to get our patients off of these medications, then that's a time to investigate further and see if there's something else going on. Why do they ha continue to have um, symptoms and need to be reliant on a proton pump inhibitor. There are children who have recurrent esophagitis who need to be on these medications long term, but I think we should all be c cognizant about not keeping them on the medicines without doing our diligence to make sure there isn't something else going on. Um, prokinetic agents like metoclopramide and erythromycin are used by us um, in both infants and older children. Um, and mucosal surface agents like sucrophate, uh, which um, sucrophate or caraphate is a, uh, an agent which acts at an acidic pH and binds to uh, areas of esophagitis and acts as a, like a coating medication. So for an older child, that can also be helpful for um, esophagitis. This is a schematic of a parietal cell, just showing you the, 
mechanism of an H2 blocker versus a proton pump inhibitor. Um, an H2 blocker acts at the basal um, membrane and it, it only acts to block, uh, histamine is only one uh, stimulator of acid release from a parietal cell. So acting on the apical um, uh, H2 pump uh, or the acid pump is more efficacious. The, the proton pump inhibitor is a more efficacious medica medication because of that. Um, H2 blockers, the benefit of an H2 blocker is that the peak plasma concentration occurs more quickly. It's only about two and a half hours, um, whereas the proton pump inhibitor can take up to three or four days until it reaches full efficacy. Um, an H2 blocker can be used safely for reflux symptoms and esophagitis, and it's often a first-line medication for children with reflux symptoms. Tacoflaxis can occur with chronic use, so um, it's not uncommon for us to have kids who stop responding to an H2 blocker over time. A proton pump inhibitor, again, has superior efficacy because it goes right to the, to the um, acid pump on the apical side of the parietal membrane and shuts down the um, proton pump. And the effect does not diminish with chronic use. Uh, of note, the proton pump inhibitor works best taken once per day on an empty stomach about 30 minutes before breakfast, which can be tough for some parents to get that. But I try to tell them as close as they can to 30 minutes before the child eats breakfast. Um, lansoprazole or Prevacid is one type of proton pump inhibitor, and you can see that the efficacy is very good for, for reflux symptoms in children. Um, this is uh, a study done with 66 children with reflux symptoms. Um, after a 12-week course of Prevacid, and um, the, the symptoms resolve in the majority of patients who are taking this medication over a 12-week course. And it also has been shown to heal esophagitis. So we, we know that this medication, this type of medication works well to, um, to improve reflux symptoms and to heal esophagitis. Um, and because of that, it can be helpful in, um, in using these medications in an, in an, empir an empiric way um, over a 12-week course, because if the patient isn't responding over a 12-week course, then again, we're looking for another reason for those symptoms and not um, thinking that this is solely reflux-related. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, fundoplication, because um, Many children, uh, uh, fundoplication is a last resort for, um, an, uh, for dealing with reflux and treating reflux. There are some children who have such respiratory symptoms, obviously, um, who, who need an anti-reflux procedure. But we take, we take that very seriously um, in deciding who to refer for this procedure. And this is why. Um, these are outcomes of anti-reflux surgery in children. The success rate is very good, but the complication rate is quite high. Um, and the laparoscopic procedures uh, as well have a um, high complication rate and a high need for reoperation. So we see these kids coming back with symptoms like gas bloat um, and dumping syndrome and persistent reflux that um, in many cases requires a, a reoperation. So it, it, it in itself is not a, um, a complete fix, though there are some children who do, um, it is, it is um, necessary for. So in summary, um, reflux is common in healthy infants. It usually resolves by 12 to 18 months of age, and if it doesn't, then we are starting to think about other um, entities, particularly allergy. Uh, the approach to diagnosis and treatment is not one size fits all. It depends on the signs and symptoms and severity. Uh, currently available tests don't conclusively demonstrate a relationship between reflux and specific symptoms in many, many cases. So, and often it's a, a combination of tests that are needed in order to put uh, the puzzle together. Um, and a thorough history and clinical judgment are imperative um, because many times this, this diagnosis can be made clinically and um, treated clinically before needing to go through many dis different testing modalities. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to take some questions. So we have time for about five minutes of questions. Uh, please introduce yourself. Right here. 
So the, Gloria, um, can, can you just repeat it? So that sure. The, the question is, um, uh, what is the maximum dose of proton pump inhibitor that you can use for the infants? And um, I agree with you that I would start at one milligram per kilogram per day. We will sometimes go up as high as three milligrams per kilogram per day. But as a general rule, one milligram per kilogram per day is a good starting dose and should be efficacious in infants. I have a, I have a question about H. pylori. Sure. Um, the first part, it's a two-part question, I guess. The first part has to do with um, if you were treating somebody with a proton pump inhibitor and they have H. pylori, doesn't that, it'll, it'll still get better? So the part two question of that is, do you just test every, or should we test anybody who we diagnose with um, gastritis for H. pylori in our well, office? You, you can test. If, if you are going to test for H. pylori, the, the the most efficacious test is an H. pylori fecal antigen. The serologies are not reliable, and they're not sensitive nor specific. Um, my inclination would be to say that if you treat empirically with a proton pump inhibitor and things get better, then you have your answer. But if you pull someone off after two or three months and they start to complain again, then you're, again, that's the time when you start to think, an H. pylori is one of those things that could be going on. Um, uh, we could test at that point um, for the fecal antigen, and we also may consider uh, endoscopy at that point, and that would give us our answer as well, as well as answer the question about allergies or an ulcer. So. My partner and I are here from the other side of the river, and we found that some of the gastroenterologists are giving the PPIs with the H2 blockers, and we're just like, Wondering if that's something yeah. that has been studied or done, or no, is this just something not. we're and, trying and to I, do, and should we go along with that? I, I don't, myself, and I know most of my colleagues in GI won't give them together. Um, I, I, the, the efficacy of the PPI is so much greater than the H2 blocker that I think that you are surpassing it when you start a, a PPI, and I think of it as the second step above an H2 blocker. So I, myself, don't use them together. That's how we've used it also, but then you get to that difficult to control patient and parent that needs something else. Sometimes we'll give the PPIs twice a day. We'll split the dose and give a morning and a nighttime dose just to tr we try to We found that to be much more 24 hour coverage. In our practice. You found that to be better? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes we'll do that. Thank you. <laughs>